Hi everyone, my name is Casey Pelzel and I am a biostatistician with the American College of Radiology's Neiman Health Policy Institute. And I am here to chat with you today about research methods and study design. So these are the standard run-of-the-mill study designs that you'll typically see in publications. I imagine you're all familiar with the majority of these, if not all of them. And today we're just going to review what each of these study types um, allows for, allows for you to do as a researcher and allows for your readership to glean as they read your results. The first thing we're going to review is how you identify a study design. The first question in this flowchart asks whether an investigator assigned the exposure. And this term exposure can apply to an intervention or a treatment process or an educational seminar, uh, really just something that affects the patients or um, population being studied. If the exposure is assigned, then we know we're dealing with an experimental study. And if the exposure is not assigned, then we know we're dealing with an observational study, like most of the studies listed on the previous slide. Um, next, we are going to review the temporality in context of each study type. So at the top of the slide, you see our very scientific and detailed timeline, <laughs> delineating the present today, the past, and the future. All of the study types that we're going to talk about have a different temporality um, in how they're performed and how the data are collected. A cross-sectional study is a look at today's data, what's happening at this moment or at some specified um, snapshot in time. A case control study starts with the point of view of the patient today. You know the outcome and whether or not the population or patient has it. Then you look back to see if they experienced your exposure of interest. Next are the cohort studies in randomized controlled trials. As of today, you know the exposure, or in the case of an RCT, you assigned the exposure, and then you follow the patients forward to see if your outcome of interest occurs. Last is a little bit of an outlier. Um, it's the retrospective cohort study, also known as a historical prospective study. So your starting point is the existence of an exposure way back in the historical data. These data have been collected. It's a registry or an EHR. And then you prospectively comb through the data up until the present day or some established point in time to see if your outcome of interest ever occurred. So all this talk of exposures and outcomes and treatments and diseases, how do they line up for each study type? So in this table, we'll examine what a research question might sound like for each of these study types. For instance, in our cross-sectional study design, we asked, what are the rates of MRI utilization among patients with various knee injuries? Now, please bear with me. I am not a physician, so I'm just making up some very rudimentary and dumb study ideas, but it'll help us get a grasp on things. In a cross-sectional study, we know our exposure. Here, it's the type of injuries that occurred in January 2022. And we know our exposure here, or excuse me, outcome. Here, it's the use of MRI in evaluating the injuries. We are able to calculate the rate of MRI usage in each type of injury. And you see that in the last column. Now, in a case con case control study, we ask whether or not patients with a surgically repaired meniscus tear were more likely to have a certain risk factor or demographic difference than patients who didn't require surgery. In this study design, we know our outcomes. Um, we identified 20 patients with surgical repair and 20 without surgical repair, and then look back to see if there are any of those significantly associated risk factors in their medical histories. Now, in our cohort study, we want to answer whether or not smoking causes arthritis. In this design, we know our exposure. It's smoking. So we identify a patient population that is comprised of both smokers and non-smokers, and then follow them forward to see if smoking means you have a greater chance of developing osteoarthritis. Lastly, in our randomized controlled trial, we want to know if preventative visco supplement injections reboot the reduce the need for joint surgeries. Now, this fake study idea isn't taking into account ethics or feasibility or general rationality, but it's just an example of how a study might go. We would randomize ortho patients coming into our clinic, um, into the treatment and the non-treatment groups, and then follow them forward for a period of time to determine if the injections help them avoid surgical repair. Now, um, now that we know how our study designs are oriented around exposure, outcome, data temporality. Let's examine why or why not we choose a certain um, study design. 
A cross-sectional study is normally your easiest, cheapest, and quickest study. Hospitals love to hear those words. It's a great design for a pilot study that may help you focus on something that you've been seeing anecdotally in your practice and can help you eventually devise a hypothesis-driven study. Cross-sectional studies allow you to study multiple exposures and outcomes simultaneously, but you will not be able to infer any causality because this type of study is examining a snapshot of data um, additionally, one of the primary sources of bias that you have to um, take into account is misclassification. Without a patient's full history, it's possible to inappropriately bucket them and may cause some um, misguided conclusions. So that's just something to take care of. Case control studies are a valuable way to study multiple exposures that could be associated with your known outcome. These studies are great for studying rare outcomes like, let's say, pulmonary embolism. Um, they're pretty expen inexpensive. They typically employ data that have already been collected in a registry or an EHR. Um, however, with a case, con case control study, you kind of run the risk of a chicken or egg situation of potential reverse causation inferences where the temporality of your exposure and outcome may get a bit tangled and become hard to decipher. Additionally, the biases that you need to attempt to mitigate are selection, recall, and sampling. Bottom line, you have to make sure you choose the right patient population, not casting too wide or too narrow a net. Finally, in the cohort study, you have the chance to follow a patient after a known exposure, or when we're going to talk about randomized controlled trials, an assigned exposure. Um, so here, cohort studies are great for rare exposures, like something like radiation poisoning, for instance, but not great for rare outcomes, like let's say a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. So cohort studies tend to be more expensive. They are difficult to set up. They run for a long time. They can uh, lose a lot of patients to follow up. There can be a lot of issues, but you do get the most robust answers when you run a cohort study. Um, the biases for um, cohort studies are quite different because data collection is much more intensive. You have a lot more patient interactions and um, the, the study just goes on a lot longer. So um, randomized controlled trials, they're a bit of a different animal and they deserve their own slide. So here we are, the randomized controlled trial, the gold standard for saying this happened because of this or this caused that. In these studies, the exposure of the intervention is not only known, it is assigned. So after randomization, the resulting groups should be the same on all potential confounders. Some of the most common methods for randomization are listed here, and um, you just have to choose which one makes sense for your situation. For instance, with stratified, um, if we are examining a breast cancer population, uh, we probably would want to stratify our randomization based on sex because we know that breast cancer um, looks very different in men than it does in women. So what do you get out of each of these study designs? Um, so we've already looked at the temporality. We, we know um, how data are collected for each of these. Um, case control study is a looking back at existing data, randomized controlled trials and cohorts, collect data prospectively. So what are we measuring in each of these studies? So in cross-sectional studies, we're looking at rates and proportions without any inference of causality. In case control studies, we wanna know what the odds of having an exposure is given a known outcome. These results are presented as odds ratios and confidence intervals. Lastly, in our cohort study um, and randomized controlled trials, we wanna assess the incidental occurrence of a disease or other sort of um, outcome. Results in these types of prospective studies are presented as relative risks or hazard ratios, also with confidence intervals. So now we know why we choose a design, how we choose a design, what data collection and assessment looks like, and what our measures are. What other types of studies do we care about? So these are the last two. Then you will typically see these in each issue of your favorite publication because people don't always have access to data or don't have the time to collect data. So systematic reviews are exactly what they sound like. They are a review of all the extant literature on a specific topic. They require the evaluation and synthesis of years or decades of work 
um, and typically a, employ a panel of experts that have a vested interest in the subject. Um, Meta-analyses are a little different. They are a subset of systematic reviews and require the compilation of data from several pertinent studies to support existing findings or help you publish new ones. They are statistically robust. They have larger sample size than single studies and increased diversity as well. However, some people challenge their validity and say that their utility is a little less because oftentimes you're pooling data from studies that have very, very different patient populations and may have used very different methods to collect their data. Okay, so let's break it all down. Cross-sectional studies are looking at the right now. What are the rates and exposures or excuse me, the rates of exposures and outcomes that currently exist in our population of interest at this moment or at a specific moment in time. Case control studies take a look back. Our outcome is identified as the starting point and we look in the past to find the presence or absence of an exposure or risk factor of interest. They're cheap, short, easy, and because the data is already there, it can, um, it can move ahead right away with a quick IRB approval. Um, cohort studies start at the exposure and look forward to see if an outcome happens. You can study multiple exposures and outcomes and get a grasp on causal links. For them, we report odds ratios and relative risks. Randomized controlled trials are the gold standard. They enroll patients, assign an exposure as a treatment or intervention, and then follow a patient for a period of time to see if an outcome develops. They're the most expensive in terms of money and time investments but they help us develop drugs and treatments for patients with the reporting of odds ratios, relative risks, and hazard ratios. So that does it. You now have a grasp on the different study types that are at your fingertips. So go forth and research. And next time we're gonna talk about measures of central tendency.